The best way to predict the future is to create the future. You create your own future. You don't have to worry about any predictions. I believe that. And I believe that since I was a little boy. Now, in 1965, late January, I was nine years old. I was really looking forward to my 10th birthday, which was going to be on February 23rd of 1965. I visualized, I believed that I was going to get my first bike, my own bike. That's what I really wanted. In 1965, 48 million 584 people died. I was supposed to be one of them. I was declared dead for three minutes in 1965. But I was given a second life. I was given a second chance. And from that moment on, I decided that I was going to use all of the gifts that God gave me to lead a fulfilling life, to make my life the best life for myself and for others. So let me tell you my story. I talked about 1965. I need to go back a little bit in time to talk about my mom and my dad. My mom and my dad, they both had to quit school before they graduated. My dad was 13, my mom was 14. They came from very poor backgrounds. They didn't have formal education, but they were intelligent people. They were smart. And when they got married and they decided that they wanted to have children, they said that the most important thing to them was that their children would be well educated. They tried to have children and they couldn't. And my mom went to see the doctor and the doctor said, unfortunately, you will never have children. And my mom said, I, I don't believe that. I feel myself as a mother. I see myself as a mother. I see myself holding babies. I will be a mother. She didn't call it manifestation. People didn't use that term back then. But that's what she believed. She saw that happening. And she convinced herself that it would happen. About a year later, I was born. So my mom was right and the doctors were wrong. And over the next 11 years, four more Tarantino children were born. So my mom and dad had five children. Now it's 1961. I'm six years old. I was to go to school for the very first time. I didn't want to go to school. I said to my mom, why do I have to go to school? I already know everything. <laughs> what do I possibly need to go to school for? I know how to read. I know how to write. I know how to do simple mathematics. I didn't say simple, but I knew how to add and subtract. Why do I need to go to school? She said, you're going to school. So the very first day, I go to school, and it is my teacher's very first day as a teacher. So my first day as a student, her first day as a teacher. And she's very excited and she's very happy and she says, class, at the end of this school year, you will know how to read this book. And she holds up a book. It was called, I still remember it. It was called Tip and Mitten. It was about a dog and a cat. She said, you will learn how to read this book by the end of the year. And by the end of the year, you will know how to write your name. And you will know she had some addition and subtraction equations on the blackboard, you will know how to do sub subtraction and addition. That's what you will learn this year. And this little boy in the front row raises his hand and said, teacher, I already know how to do all that. And she said, no, you're going to learn this this year. I said, teacher.
teacher. I already know how to do all that. And she said, okay, come up and show me. Let me see if you can read this book. And so I begin reading the book. She said, all right, you know how to read. Let me see if you can write your name. So I wrote my full name, John Anthony Tarantino. And I wrote my address, 18 Europe Street, Providence, Rhode Island, and the zip code, 02903. She said, okay, you know how to write. Let me see if you can do these equations. So I went to the board. There were five equations I did. She said, sit down. Don't say anything. I said, <laughs> said, now for the rest of the class. This is what we're going to learn. So she said, John, I have one other question for you. Do you know your telephone number? And I said, I do. She said, what is it? I said, it's 467-2624. She said, thank you. At the end of the day, she dialed 467-2624 to talk to my mom. And she said, you have a very gifted son. He's really gifted. He should skip the first grade. He should go right to the second grade. He's not going to learn anything here. I can't teach him anything. And my mom said, no, my teacher's name was Miss Dooley. I said, no, Miss Dooley, you're wrong. He, he knows how to read. You have to teach him how to understand. Teach him understanding this year. He knows how to count. Teach him what counts. Teach him how to be a first grader. Teach him how to interact with all these other young children. Teach him the important things. He has the gifts. Teach him how to use those gifts. And so Ms. Dorley did. And she gave me lots of different assignments and lots of reading assignments and much more difficult homework. There really wasn't any homework for the other kids, but she gave me homework. And I had a great first year, and I learned a lot. Now, I'll fast forward to 2004. 2004, I'm a very successful attorney. As Gary said, in 2004, they have rating systems in the United States. I was ranked that year in the top 10 attorneys in the entire United States by judges and other lawyers. I was very successful. I made lots of money. I was invited to many events, many fundraising events capital campaigns, things like that, to help philanthropic causes. And I go to an event, and I'm in line waiting to get in, and there's an elderly woman in front of me. She hears my voice, and she turns around and she says, hello, John. And I'm thinking, I'm well known, so lots of people know who I am. And she said, you don't know who I am, do you? And I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, I, I really don't. She said, I'm Miss Dorley your first grade teacher. And she said, it's been a long time since we met. She said, I have followed your career. I've read about you in the paper. I've watched you on television. That little boy used the gifts that God gave him. I'm very proud of you. Can I tell you a story to this group? And so I said, sure. And so she told the entire group the story of the little boy who raised his hand. And she said, I knew that day when I talked to his mom that he was going to be something special. I knew it. And I knew that he would use the gifts that God gave him, not only to have a fulfilling life, but to do good. Now it's 1965. I'm going to turn 10. I want that bike. I want it badly. I was really excited. I was an altar boy. And one of my jobs as an altar boy was to pull on the rope and ring the big bell in the steeple. I pulled on the rope, I rang the bell, and my side hurt. My right side hurt. I finished, I finished the mass, I went home, and I told my mom I didn't feel well, that my side hurt. And she said, you're too little to be ringing that bell. I'm going to talk to the priest. You shouldn't do that. I said, mom, don't do that. Don't talk to the priest. I can ring the bell. She said, just rest for a little you feel better. Well, I didn't feel better. I got more and more ill. She called the doctor. In those days, doctors actually came to your house to, to treat you, visit you. And the doctor came and he probed and prodded and poked in my side. He said, he's fine. He's fine. If there was anything serious, your son would be moaning and crying. He's okay. He can't be in that much discomfort. My mom said, you don't know my son. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't cry. He's not like that. Doctor said he's 
A few hours later, I became violently ill. I was taken by ambulance to the hospital. And they diagnosed me with a burst appendix. Gangrene had already set in. The doctors told my mom and dad that I was not going to live. They said, it's too late. We can't do anything for him. They said, have the priest come. Give your son the last rites. He's going to die. And my mom said, he's not going to die. I see him alive. I see him in the future. He's a man. He has a family. He's not going to die. And so I was in a coma. My mom kissed me. And she said, God, let him live. He hasn't yet used all the gifts you gave him. I woke up. I woke up. I was in the hospital for a long, long time. I missed my birthday. I missed my bike. But I was alive. And I decided that I would take advantage of that second life that God gave me. The second life, the life that my mom had manifested, had seen. And that I would do good things with the gifts that God gave me. Now, I don't believe in coincidence, as you'll see as I go through this talk. I don't believe in it. I believe things happen for a reason and for a purpose. So yesterday, I'm in Belfast, I get here, and it's toward the end of the day, and I decide that I'm going to take a walk across the street, and I'm gonna go into the Belfast City Hall and see this magnificent building. What's there? I'm interested in those kinds of things. I go into the City Hall, and I see the crest, the coat of arms of the city of Belfast. It's, two, it's a wolfhound and two chimera, or so sort of mystical secrets. And underneath the coat of arms, in Latin, it says, for all that we have been given, what shall we return? For all that we have been given, what shall we return? It was in Latin. Remember, I was an altar boy, so I don't speak Latin. And that comes from Proverbs 1, 16, 12. That's what that statement comes from. And Proverbs, in the New Testament, the same thing is told in what's called the parable of the talents. In the parable of the talents, there is a master and two servants. And the master calls in the servants and he says, I am going to be away for a long time. I don't know when I'm going to come back. I'm going to give you these talents. Talents were money, coins. I'm going to give you these talents. And when I come back, I'm going to ask you both, what have you done with the talents I gave you? What have you done with the gifts I bestowed upon you? And the master is gone for years. And then one day, far in the distance, the servants see the master. <coughs> and they get excited and a little nervous. And the master comes into the household. And he says to the servants, as he promised he would, what have you done with the talents I gave you? And the first servant says, Master, I took your talents. I grew them. I distributed them. I made people not only aware of your generosity, but of your goodness. I used your talents. I grew them. I made profit for you. And the master said, you are a good and faithful servant. Come into my household. You will be rewarded even greater. The second servant, he said, what have you done with the talents I gave you? And the second servant said, Master, you could be a harsh man. I was afraid that I would lose your talents. I wouldn't be successful. So I buried them in the backyard. I hid them. I secured them. No one saw them. I dug them up when I saw you coming. I'm giving them back to you. Here are your talents back. And the master said, you did not do what I wanted. You did not use the talents I gave you for a good purpose. You did not grow them. You did not distribute them. You did not make profit from them. You hid them. You buried them. For those to whom I give talents, who use them wisely, they will be rewarded. 
for those to whom I give talents, and they bury them or hide them, and they cast them out. That's the parable of the talents. And I have lived my life consistent with the parable of the talents. I've lived my life to say, what gifts, what talents has God given me? And how will I use those talents to do good? Not just for myself, but how can I lift others up? How can I make the community stronger? That's what I focused my life on. I recovered from my first appendix. I went back to school. I did well in school. I did so well in school that I was accepted at one of the most prestigious colleges and universities in the United States. The problem was it was really expensive to go there, very expensive. So no matter how much scholarship I had or loans, student loans, I had a work study where I'd work in the kitchen at the cafeteria, all of those things combined weren't enough for me to afford to go to college. My parents didn't have any money. But I, was, I saw myself not only as going, but as graduating and being successful. I saw that. I manifested it. I believed it. And so I said, how can I do this? So I went to the guidance counselor, and I said, I need to graduate early. I can't afford four years of college. How can I do that? He said, well, um, I don't think you can. He said, we have trimesters, three times a year, three courses each trimester, nine courses in a year. It's a very hard curriculum. I said, what if I take five courses instead of three? He said, you will fail. You will not be able to do it. It's too much work. I said, can I try? He said, you can try, but you'll probably fail after the first trimester. I took five instead of three, same cost for a trimester. I didn't fail after the first trimester or the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth. And I was able to graduate in three years instead of four. The professors saw me do this. They asked me why I was doing it and I told them because I needed to save money. I didn't have enough money to pay. They said, come out of the kitchen want to be a job in the kitchen, we're going to give you a job as a researcher for us, and we can pay you more money. And they did. And so with the money that I got as a researcher, and taking five courses instead of three courses, I was able to graduate a year early, save a year's tuition, a year's room, and board, and I saw exactly what I thought I was going to be. I believed in myself that I could do it. When everyone said, you can't do it, I saw that I could. When I was in college, I decided that I wanted to be an attorney. I actually wanted to be a professional baseball player, but no matter how hard I manifested that, it was not gonna happen. But I decided I wanted to be an attorney. And I know that I needed to save some money and get a job so that I could go to law school. Back in those days, there were newspapers, actual newspapers that people read. And in the back of the newspapers, there were want ads. And they listed jobs that were available, people could apply for jobs. And so I saw a job and I applied for a job. And I got an interview and I found out that I was the finalist for this job. And I was to go to the office at a certain day and a certain time for my final interview. And I got to that office in the reception area and there was a beautiful young woman there. Spectacularly beautiful. And I'm saying, I'm sitting here and she's sitting here. Why are we both sitting here? And I said, excuse me, are, are you here applying for this job? And she said, I am. She said, are you? I said, I am. I said, I guess we're the competition. And I said, I'll make a deal with you. Whoever gets the job will take the other out to dinner. <laughs> and the young woman, her name was Pat, 
said to me, where would you like to go to dinner? <laughs> so I said, not only is she beautiful, she's confident. Mm -hmm. Well, we both had the interviews, and as I say, I got the job in packing the hospital. Oh. I took her out to dinner. We obviously hit it off. And one year exactly to the day of the job interview, we were there on June 24th, 1977. And she was my wife, 45 years. In those 45 years, we had three beautiful children and four beautiful grandchildren. I thought I had used all the gifts that God had given. I really did. I was super successful as a lawyer. I was very wealthy. We had a beautiful home, wonderful family. We could do anything. We could go anywhere. Cost wasn't an option. I had clients all around the world who wanted my services. I thought I would have a really good answer at the end of my life when God said, what have you done with the talents I gave you? And then something happened out of the blue. One day, Pat said, my hip hurts. I said, well, Pat, we're in our 60s. I said, maybe it's arthritis. Maybe you need a hip replacement. She said, no, it just doesn't feel right. I felt fine before. It doesn't feel right. So I said, well, go and see a doctor. Um, go and see a doctor. And she did. And the doctor took an MRI of her hip and found an eight centimeter lesion in her hip. So we knew she had cancer. The lesion, we didn't know what kind. I got an appointment with an oncologist. And the oncologist, almost in a whisper, said, you have stage four pancreatic cancer. Stage four. He said, do you want a prognosis? And immediately, my wife said, no. I don't want to be cabined in what you think how long I have to live. Only God knows that. It gives me a day, a week, a month, and a year. I'm going to live my life the fullest that I can live. I'm going to live it with grace. I'm going to love my family. I'm going to do good. I manifested. I tried. I tried to see her recover. I couldn't see it. Several months later, Pat was in hospice. We knew it was only going to be a few days. And she said to me, <clears throat> John, we always talked about the gifts that God has given us. I don't have much time left. She said, I need two favors from you. I said, whatever you want. She said, the first favor is we have life insurance policies on each other's lives. We kept from when the kids were late. She said, I would like you to donate the proceeds of my life insurance policy to cancer research so people don't have to suffer the way that I did. I said, done. Done. And then she said, Are you going to live in the house after I passed? <coughs> our children were grown, they live all around the United States. I said, No, I'm not going to live in the house by myself. And she said, <clears throat> Can I ask you to also donate? the proceeds of the sale of the house to cancer research. And I said, if that's what you want, then that's what we'll do. And that was around $5 million, which sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But I knew it, was only, it wasn't going to be enough to do what I now know that I needed to do. And so my manifestation from that day forward, I knew I couldn't save Pat, but I could save others. That would be her legacy. And so I formed the John and Pat Tarantino Foundation to fight pancreatic cancer and now all cancers. I recruited top 
oncologists from around the world to come to Rhode Island to make Rhode Island first class in cancer research. We have some of the greatest oncologists in the United States who now live and work in Rhode Island with a lab that we built there for cancer research. And I manifest. I see that day. I see that day. I don't know how old I will be. I don't know how much strength I will have left. But whatever strength I have left on that day, when there is a cure, I will shout at the top of my lungs, pancreatic cancer, Pat has been. thing that I manifest in closing. I see this every day. I feel it. I know it's going to happen. I know I'm going to be alive when that day happens. I know it. <clears throat> and I know, remember my mom gave me the kiss back in 1965? And she said, you haven't used all the gifts yet. And I woke up. I know feel it, I manifest it, but I will get another kiss. This one will be 